Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a guy that would like to remind us all that flies in the Vaseline we are. Here is the captain. And the colonel would like to remind you he is half the man he used to be. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Raspberry Russian Ending by the good folks over at Winter Hill Brewing Company. This is a 9.2% ABV delicate imperial stout with raspberry. This baby is dark and delicious with rich aromas of dark chocolate and roasted malts and finishes with raspberry and caramel flavors. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And let's give some bottle caps out to our good friends who helped us out with this week's beer fund. First up, a nice cheers to Janelle in Chicago, Illinois. And a big we like your jib to Elizabeth in High Point, North Carolina. And here's a cheers to Barb from right here in Columbus, Ohio. And a big shout out to Sean from Bakersfield. And a tiny little shout out to Dakota in Pueblo, Colorado. And last but certainly not least, we have Kylie in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Everyone we just mentioned, well, they helped us out with this week's beer fund. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N Beer Run. A couple new shirts are going to be in the store this week. So go check them out today. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. beautiful and beloved young woman is brutally murdered just yards from her own home. Her battered body left behind a building like discarded rubbish. Surely, only a sadistic, experienced killer could assault and strangle this bubbly, popular teen in the middle of a dense city and retreat undetected into the night. Or could the killer be someone closer to her? someone whom the young victim loved and trusted. The following is a blog post from Catherine Kremen. I vividly recall this day years ago when I was taking the train home from work, not knowing what to expect when I got there, but scared out of my wits. Somehow, a nun was beside me on the train and reached out to me and helped me to pray. I don't know what I was praying for, I just know she may have saved me from losing my mind. I recall every second of that day. My Christine also saved me from losing my mind. She was my strength when I walked through the door to my home, and her aunt told me Deanna was dead. I did not know what to do. I did not know anything. I felt like I was not even present. Losing my daughter and learning how she was murdered was too difficult to believe or understand. I could not process it at the time. As the day went on, Deanna's aunt Kathleen came over, and I knew she could identify with me. I found strength from her. Thank you, Kathy. In case you never knew it, that is true. It was when my brother came that I knew I was horrified. He is a Vietnam veteran, and I will never forget talking with him and feeling literally like the floor under my feet was falling and I was falling with it. His presence also helped to save me from losing my mind. I am so thankful to all the people who came to my house to be there for me and for my family. Now, here it is. All of these years later, you know how I feel. I am going to solve this murder. I'm going to do it soon. The person who murdered my daughter, Deanna, also severely damaged my family. 
in ways that I cannot explain. He did not destroy me, but he came close. Today, I am a force to be reckoned with. I believe I can get him, and get him without violence if he is lucky enough for that not to happen. I saved him once, I won't do it again. I just felt I would share these thoughts today. I hope that every member of this group knows how grateful I am for their love and kindness and continuous support over the years. There are a few people who lack compassion and have been unkind and bottom line undignified and disgusting, but that is on them. Shame on them. I will end it like this. I have my grief and my heartbreak tucked away in a safe place. In my heart, I have more strength than you can imagine. I am so thankful for your kindness. There will be justice for Deanna Crimin. I promise. This is True Crime Garage, and this is the case of Deanna Crimin. Deanna Jean Kremen was born on March 26, 1978. In 1995, she lived in Somerville, Massachusetts with her mom, Catherine, her stepfather, Michael, and her brothers and sister. Her biological father, Albert Rogers, lived in New Hampshire. Now, the state border is not far from Somerville. Somerville is a blue-collar city northwest of Boston with a population of about 81,000 people. Deanna was born in the Somerville area, but the family moved to California for a short period of time, returning when she was nine years old. They moved into a house on Jacques Street in the Winter Hill neighborhood, which Catherine describes as lower middle class. But I think that we should clarify something when we hear Catherine say lower middle class. It's my understanding, Captain, that this is kind of a high cost of living area. There's a lot of people, so the houses are in high demand and a rather expensive area to live. Right. Some people may recall, longtime listeners of this show, our Trail of Blood episodes. This is episode number 416 and 417 that we did back in August of 2020 with the guilty party being Edward O'Brien for the murder of Janet Downing. Today's case takes place in the same area, Somerville, Massachusetts, and the same year, 1995. Deanna was close with her sister, Christine, who was just 17 months older than her. They shared a room and bickered over clothing. Their younger brothers were Mark, 11 years younger, and Albert, 4 years younger. Deanna was a junior at Somerville High School. She was, to a certain extent, a normal teenager. She hung out with her friends who recall her laughing all the time. She loved to dance and go to the local arcade. She stole cigarettes and drank beer behind the dumpster. That's my favorite place to drink beer. It's my kind of girl. In one episode, her friends recount with smiles. Deanna and her friend cut school one day and went to Dunkin' Donuts. Deanna's stepfather walks into the Dunkin' Donuts to discover her, his stepdaughter cutting school and he collected her and drove her back to school after buying his coffee. Deanna was also training to be a cashier at the Star Market. This is around the corner from her home where she had been working for a couple of months. She babysat on the side for extra money, but she also gave back to the community, volunteering at the local cable channel, Somerville Cable Access Television, and working with third graders at a local school as part of the early childhood development program that she was enrolled in at SHS. Her plan was to go into teaching. Now, unlike most teens her age, Deanna valued her family, spending time with her disabled grandmother and goofing around with her siblings. She loved cats, pizza, the color purple, and she hated being short. I have here that she was listed at five foot two inches 
tall or five foot two inches short, as Deanna may say. On the day that she died, Deanna wrote out a list of her life goals. This is one of those weird things that you come across in some of these cases, these weird stories where on the same day that she was killed, she's writing a list of life goals. This was part of a school assignment. Her goals, as she listed that day, were to graduate high school, find a job that she enjoyed, have a dark green convertible Mustang, have a family, a happy family, and live a long and healthy life. Well, you also wonder if she wanted to go into education, if she was planning on going to college. On the afternoon of Wednesday, August 29th, 1995, this is just three days before Deanna's 17th birthday, she and her mom found themselves on the same public bus. Deanna was returning to her neighborhood after shopping with friends after school, and Catherine was coming home from her job in Boston. Deanna got off the bus and went to her boyfriend Tommy's house. Deanna had been dating Tommy for about two years. In the years past, the two would meet up to do their homework in the kitchens at one of their homes as they lived not too far apart. Deanna's mother, Catherine, tells us that Tommy was always polite and quiet when the teens were at her home. But this school year, Tommy had already graduated from Somerville High School. He's 19 years old in 1995, so he's older than Deanna. Now, Deanna's curfew was 10 p.m. on school nights. On this night, she called home and said she would be late. She was going to stay and watch some TV with her boyfriend. Right. Catherine said, okay, come home after this show's over that you're watching. Catherine says that she fell asleep on the couch around midnight. When she woke up, she discovered that Deanna was not home. So she called the pager that she had gotten for Deanna for her 17th birthday. She had just gave her this pager a few days earlier. But Deanna did not return the page. Yeah, every time I hear the <laughs> the word pager, it's very nostalgic. And a bit silly. Like when I it's one of those items that seemed very important in the mid nineties. And seemed very cool. But it's like I've completely forgotten that they even existed until I till I read some of these old stories. Well, and like you said, it's so pointless. It's so pointless that one day I got like I don't know, five or six pages in a row. And all I could think was so nice that you're telling me to call you, but there's no way for me to call you. This item is ridiculous. And I rolled it, rolled down my window and threw the pager out the window. Yeah. I had one and I think I paid for a full year's plan and used it for about 30 or 40 days and <laughs> never yeah. used the thing again. Now, Catherine says that when she woke up, she tries to page her daughter. Deanna never returns the call. She says that she just assumed that Deanna may have stayed over at Tommy's house. This is something that would not be the first time that she had stayed there. Right. So she was planning on, you know, giving Deanna the what for when she got home. You know, she didn't call and ask if she could stay. She just called and said she would be late. Well, I'm like, look, we, we know her mother fell asleep on the couch. It, it's possible sometimes teenagers are watching a movie and they end up falling asleep. So on Thursday, March 30th, this is when Catherine got up to get ready for her day. She discovers that Deanna's not home. And she says that around 7 a.m. she called over to Tommy's house and said to Tommy, hey, put Deanna on the phone. Tommy says she's not here. She went home last night. Now, Catherine had to leave to go to work. Her husband, Michael, Deanna's stepfather, called Somerville High School. Remember, this was a school night to make sure that Deanna was at school. Right. Assuming maybe she just went to school that morning. Well, at this point, you're not getting any calls back from your pages. You just talked to her boyfriend. He said, look, she went home. They're going there's no sign that she ever came home. So at this point, you're not worried about scolding her or, or grounding her. You're just, you want to make sure she's okay. So you're calling where she's supposed to be Somerville high school. Turns out she's not at school either. Later that day, Michael 
called Catherine at work and said, you better come home. This is her, her father, her stepfather. Yeah. So around 8 a.m. that morning, two little girls who oddly enough, Deanna occasionally babysat. They're walking to their elementary school. They take this shortcut and they cut behind a senior citizen housing complex. This is on Jacques street there. They find lying near a chain link fence on the cold ground, their babysitter's dead body. Deanna was lying on her back and she's not only dead, but she's partially nude. Yeah. This is awful. I, I, and just think what these little girls minds are going through. Now, the spokesperson for the Middlesex DA's office said that Deanna died from manual strangulation. Someone killed her by putting their hands around her throat and choking her to death. It was also determined that she had been sexually assaulted, although how that determination was made has never been made public. Right. But we have a time frame here. I mean, we know that she called saying that she'd be home by midnight. So now we have to talk to the boyfriend, figure out what time she left. But her body's found at 8 a.m. So we have roughly a eight-hour time period. Well, and one thing that we do not have that I really wish that we have here, because I think this would really help to hone in on the best suspect available. Right. And that would be the determination or... You know, police can figure out, detectives can often figure out, usually quite easily, if in fact our victim was killed where she was found. Right. Was this the murder scene or was it just a dump job? Was she killed elsewhere and placed here? That's something they've never stated publicly that I could find. And I would love to know that information. Well, again, this is less than a block from her home. A couple questions I'd have for the boyfriend's family is, was there some argument that night? And if she was heading home, how would she be heading home? Mm -hmm. Is she being dropped off by her boyfriend or is she walking home? Uh, Do you have any clear recollection of that? Well, her murder, of course, was incredibly shocking to the city of Somerville. This was a nice girl. She's hardworking. She's fun. Everybody that knew her, loved her. Her body was dumped very close to her home, as you pointed out, in her own neighborhood where she should be safe. This is a safe area. Now, to say that people were devastated is really an understatement here in this case. Over 1,000 people attended Deanna's funeral. Her friends blasted Billy Joel's Only the Good Die Young from their cars at the funeral procession. That's a great song which numbered over 150 vehicles. Now, in our research for this case, we spoke at length with Catherine Kremen, Deanna's mother, who is still pushing for her daughter's case to be solved after 25 years. Some of the information Catherine gave us, we cannot share with you because it is being held back by investigators in hopes of a successful prosecution one day. But in the interest of lighting a fire under prosecutors, or perhaps even maybe the perpetrator themselves, we're going to share a significant amount of information about the case and the prime suspect. After Deanna was found, police scrambled to hunt down the killer of this vibrant young girl. They processed the scene, questioned her friends, canvassed the neighborhood. They did all the usual things in an attempt to resolve this baffling and brutal murder. On April 5th, police released a composite sketch of a man, quote, seen near the place where the body was found. This man was being sought as a potential witness. No information was forthcoming. The man in the sketch was described as 40 to 45 years old, 5 foot 9 to 5 foot 11 inches tall, 165 pounds. This is really kind of weird and maybe a little unique here, Captain, because Catherine told us that later she was told that the person who described this man to police made the whole thing up. This was a 
rather misguided effort to jumpstart the investigation and maybe flush out some suspects. So this eyewitness just said, I, I think I saw somebody that looked like this, but they just made the whole damn thing up. That's correct. That that's, seems completely irresponsible. It's very irresponsible, but I think what this person was attempting to do, again, a misguided attempt in my opinion, what I believe they were attempting to do was put the heat on the actual suspect, making it sound like there was a witness right. there that could place the suspect there with the victim. But it sounds like this eyewitness had a suspect in their own mind. Could be. I have no idea. But what they were stating was with the description of this man that this was a potential witness, not necessarily a suspect composite. Right. Now, as time passed, a week after the murder, no arrests have been made, and the county DA's office, which has jurisdiction over criminal matters in this area, said publicly that they did not have a suspect, but they were looking at a few people. The Somerville mayor uh, at the time confirmed that there were three persons of interest in Deanna's murder being looked at by the Somerville PD. Well, the first has to be her boyfriend. That's where she was at the night before. He's the last person that we think she was seen with. So obviously he's on the suspect list. That's correct, Captain. The three people that they are going to be looking at and who are announced by the mayor at the time were, in fact, one, the boyfriend, two, a first responder, and three, some creepy neighborhood rapist guy. We're back. Cheers, mates. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers, Captain. So in no particular order, let's go through these three suspects. Suspect number one, we will call him Charlie the Firefighter. Mm -hmm. So one week after Deanna's murder, a story ran in the Boston Globe saying that investigators questioned a member of the Somerville Fire Department in Deanna's death. According to that paper, the firefighter comes from one of the city's politically influential families. The article cited Victor Pike, Deanna's uncle, who told the media that Deanna's friends from school told the family that one of the firemen at the Central Firehouse on Broadway had recently expressed an interest in Deanna. Deanna and her friends would walk by the firehouse on their way to and from school. Right. One source told The Globe that the firemen had been questioned at least twice by the police department. And do we know how old this fireman is? Well, we're going to get into that, and that's going to add to the mystery a little bit and probably the suspicions surrounding this man. Now, Catherine, her mother, told us that she later found out some more information on this firefighter. He was someone well-known to her as he had been a classmate of hers. That's right. The firefighter yeah. was about the same age as Deanna's mother. Yeah, find some of your own age, you creep bag. Well, so he's about twice the age of Deanna, but he was someone that somehow he struck up a friendship with Deanna, regularly talking with her as she passed by the firehouse. It's called grooming. Now, when Deanna told him that she was practicing driving to get her driver's license, right. He offered to take her out driving in his car to teach her how to drive. It is not known how many times this happened or how many times they may have hung out. But on one of these so-called driving lessons, Deanna's little brother, Mark, he tagged along. He's sitting in the back seat. He later tells his mother that he saw Deanna in this firefighter kissing at some point. This was in the months before she was killed. 
Catherine, of course, was horrified when she found this out and believes that this man behaved completely inappropriately. But Catherine also believes that he has been, for the most part, ruled out by investigators. Right. So he's not, he doesn't seem to be high up on the list of suspects. Well, look, again, like I said, find some of your own age. She's 17 years old. She might think she's an adult, but at that age, they don't, it's hard for, for a kid to, you know, whatever knowledge or sense to understand that, that this individual is preying on them when you're, when you're interested in a girl that young, when you're that old, that you're becoming a predator at that point. Yeah. And as a taxpayer, I would say, do your damn job. Quit trying to pick up young girls. Yeah. Play with your own goddamn hose on your own goddamn time. Get back to work, sir. All right. Suspect number two, we'll call him the creepy rapist guy. This is a man who was considered a possible suspect. This is a local Somerville man who like to befriend pretty teenage girls, drive them around in his neighborhood, buying them booze and cigarettes and trying to get them up to his apartment. I found one person online who posted the following saying that authorities were looking for anyone who had information on this guy. And the post says Antonio D is what this guy's name is, AKA Tony or AKA Vinny no shoes. <laughs> All right. Since this guy's a proven shitbag, we will use his yeah. real name. This is Antonio. Let's call him uh, Tony no shoes. I mean, that's, that's it's degra- Vinny no shoes, Vinny no shoes. That's degrading enough. Well, since this guy is a proven shitbag, we will use his real name. This is Antonio Didalto. He went to prison for rape in 1995. The story on him is this. Many people, mostly females, had some contact with this guy. He liked to cruise around Somerville and offer young girls rides. Right. He would then coax them to his apartment where he would oftentimes ask girls to take off their shoes and jump up and down. Uh. He was known to cruise the Winter Hill, Somerville area and assembly square mall areas amongst others. So the no shoes, Vinny, no shoes comes from the, the weird Foot idea that he's shit. asking these young girls to take off their shoes. I've never, um, I, I've never really understood the foot fetish thing. Well, police were desperate for anyone to come forward who had information on this guy specifically. So here's their plea to the public and persons in Deanna's neighborhood and school. Do any of you know any contact Deanna may have had with this man? Please don't be afraid to come forward. We are running out of time. Every bit of information helps. This man is an extremely dangerous sex offender. He is due to be released from prison in September of 2007. He has been serving time for sexual assault and attempted murder since the summer of 1995. So, he was active and violent in the same year that Deanna was murdered. Yeah, and we know that Deanna was sexually assaulted and she was murdered. This guy was charged and and put away b- because he raped and attempted murder. So we know that this guy, he's a he's a shitbag, but we also know that he's capable of crimes like like this. And police specified that this man, Antonio, is from Brazil, although many in the neighborhood thought that he was Italian. But he's in the system, so they should have his DNA. They should be able to test it against the DNA found at the crime scene. Possibly, but then again, you got to keep in mind, they weren't always collecting offenders' DNA. Different states started up those programs at different times. I know here in Ohio that... We've only been doing that for a decade, maybe two at the very most. So depending on when they started that up in Massachusetts, he may not be in the system. What they were afraid of is that when they're going to let this guy out of prison in September of 2007, they're saying we're running out of time because they think this dude, if he's guilty of other crimes, particularly murder, that he might just flee back to his original country. Right. 
the media reported that this suspect was in prison in Massachusetts Correctional Institute, uh, although they, I wasn't able to find out much about this guy. Although I did locate some sources that confirmed his 1995 conviction and the scheduled release in 2007. Right. Catherine, Deanna's mother, told us that this guy was a known sex offender. He's a creep. He preyed on teen girls. Although the woman that he eventually went to prison for raping was older. We should point that out. Again, we don't know whether this guy was officially cleared in Deanna's case, but he was looked at and they were asking for law enforcement was asking for more information about this guy, specifically if anybody knew Deanna had ever been in contact with this guy. Well, and even though his victim was older, that I don't think that proves anything. We have knowledge of him taking younger girls back to his apartment. Now, suspect number three is the boyfriend. Of course, we've mentioned him several times before in this story we're calling him tommy the boyfriend yeah or aka tommy two shoes now savvy true crime devoted listeners will notice by now that we have thus far largely avoided discussing this third suspect in the case right he is as you pointed out captain believed to be the last man to see deanna alive boy the first man on investigators list or boy of course Anyone's going to look at Tommy, the boyfriend in this case, because he's the boyfriend, but again, because he is saying he's the last person to have seen her that night. And as we know, Deanna was over at his house somewhat late. We just cannot determine what time she supposedly left on that Wednesday night. The couple's normal routine. This is where things get really suspicious and look really bad for this guy. Tommy two shoes. Their normal routine when Deanna was over at his house is that after they were done hanging out, he would walk her all of the way to her home. Right. And often they would sit on the front porch and hang out, you know, extend their visit, if you will, on the front porch after he walked her home. So what is he claiming happened that night? Well, I want to point out that his home is 0.6 miles from her residence. Not far. Not far. And again, normal routine was for Tommy to walk Deanna home. Now, Tommy says on that night, on March 29th, he walked her half of the way home. The boy's getting lazy. That He parted ways at the Heath and Bond Streets intersection. Uh Uh-huh. Deanna was found at 125 Jock Street per the Boston.com. Her body was found so close to that spot, it cannot be described in miles, but in feet. Mm-hmm. About 400 feet from where he says that he walked her to that night, her body is found at 8 a.m. the next morning. Very suspicious. Very weird. Very bizarre. Again, that's where you want the information. Do detectives believe she was killed in the spot that she was found? But does this uh, Tommy Two Shoes, does he have uh, any violent history? Uh, I mean, they dated, you said, for two years. As, it, there would have to be some kind of rumblings of uh, violence against her or maybe verbal abuse or something. Well, we'll get into some of that, but th- there doesn't seem to be really any of that again we have deanna's mother saying that she knew this kid and knew him well and there was no violence in their relationship all it takes is once though right so well of course everyone finds it incredibly suspicious that on the night that she happened to be killed it's the one time that he didn't walk her all the way to her house. Does he have a reason? To, yes. He okay. says that he and his good friend, his best friend, his name will, will, will say is Jason. Mm-hmm. That Jason the, Jockstrap and Tommy Two Shoes. That the two of them ordered some food, uh, mm-hmm. food delivery, that he wanted to get back to accept the food delivery, that he was he had a limited amount of time to walk her home. Now, 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 his his friend didn't walk with them. 
No, that's correct. Mm. And this friend Jason lived very close to Tommy's house. This is the weird part. So he has an alibi, right? He has his friend Jason who says, yes, that's what happened. He shows up at my house. We ordered some food. And by the way, they even have the receipt to show that to investigators. Look, you probably don't know the details on which direction the friend lived in, but you're you're talking, what do you say, 400 feet from where he left her? You'd think if this guy lived in the vicinity and he's waiting for his friend to show up that he would have heard some rumblings. Well, no, the friend lived near Tommy's house. Right. So 0.6 miles away is... Deanna's home. The friend Jason, his home backed up to the back of Tommy's house. Right. So he's still close. Still a little more than a quarter mile. That's not that far. You'd correct. think he'd hear something. And also Well, I don't think she was killed there is right. what I think went went down. I think that this is a bit of a manufactured uh alibi, but but we can get into to that i want to go through what Catherine, her mother says because she believes that maybe deanna was going to break up with tommy and maybe even break up with him that night so she could start dating the old firefighter well crusty yeah that Mm. could be who knows but she says that at the time you know before deanna was killed she didn't see any of this but later seemed to be able to piece this together. She thought that she later learned that Tommy seemed to be very possessive of her daughter. Mm -hmm. This is because Catherine found a bunch of letters that Tommy wrote to Deanna, which she says shows some very strong indicators of this possessive behavior, almost to the point which she says she called it being obsessive. Now, after Deanna died, Tommy's best friend, Jason, told Catherine that anytime Deanna left the room, even to just go to the bathroom or to get a drink, Tommy would really kind of give it to her, you know, asking her where she was going, really kind of overbearing stuff. Like ponytail Derek. Again, there were no signs of violence in this relationship, although there was one time that Catherine later recalled when Tommy could not find Deanna that he showed up at her home and he's, he's like clutching the doorway, you know, and and very angrily asking and demanding to know where Dina Deanna was. Well, yeah, hold on a second. Let's, let's not throw this guy completely under the bus because if there's rumors or some rumblings that she is, doing some driving lessons with this older firefighter. So who knows what kind of stories that she was telling him. So he might have heard, oh, well, I just saw your girlfriend in a car with an older man, you know, and and she's not answering her pager or something. I, I can see why that would be upsetting to a 19-year-old boy. Well, and I mean, you got to keep in mind, they were together for about two years. So mm-hmm. that that situation does not have to go along with the firefighter situation. No, but, it doesn't. I'm just saying that we, we, we do have uh, people saying that she was taking these driving lessons and making out with this older firefighter during the time that they were dating. Right. And that's what one thing that Catherine points out that, that either she believes either Deanna was going to break up with Tommy that right. night or maybe they had a fight that night and it could really be about anything, but possibly about the firefighter situation. Question for you. Uh, what time does Tommy two shoes call his buddy to set up this? Hey, after I drop off my girlfriend, then I'll hang out at your house. That's some information that I do not have. Right. Um, the detectives would have that information. As, again, he did provide a receipt for this food delivery. So they would have that time and and know that timeline. I do not have that information. This seems pretty late for food delivery. Yeah, it's a busy area. I would imagine you could get food delivered at 11, 12 o'clock. But it's also a school night, so it's not like 
the weekend, so less things were probably open. It's also the 90s, just less yeah, but I, things I mean, open in general. You, you always talk about the 90s like it's 100 years ago. I, you get, I it's, remember getting- It's quite a while ago. It was Right, it's 25 years ago, 26 years ago. I can remember getting food delivered at 11, 12 o'clock on a, on a weeknight. But the, Catherine goes on to say that Deanna would have had multiple reasons, she believes, for breaking up with Tommy. That they, you know, it's kind of young love, right? You grow up and you kind of grow apart. And they didn't really share the same circle of friends. Deanna was getting older and Tommy was, they had different personalities. Catherine describes Deanna as happy go lucky Uh while Tommy is described as a bit of a black cloud. You know, if they were in a group situation, he wouldn't get involved. He would kind of sit off to himself. Well, and also when you have a, a relationship where one is in high school and one is not normally the one that's not in high school doesn't want to do the high school stuff. Homecoming. I don't want to go to that prom. I don't want to go to that. I'm too cool for that. I'm too old for that. I've been there, done that. And what is a girl in high school want to, what does she want to do? She wants to go to all those events and be around her friends. In the weeks and the months after the murder, Tommy behaved somewhat strangely um, for someone who professed to love Deanna. He didn't seem to act that way after her death. He did attend the funeral. He was quite attentive to Catherine at the funeral, but he did not participate in any of the memorials or vigils dedicated to Deanna. When Catherine went over to try to talk to him, this would be about three weeks after Deanna's murder. She wanted to get some clear cut answers to some questions she had about what happened that night from Tommy. Right. She says that he acted terrified when Catherine talked about the case, uh, asking him questions. And she told him that night that she thought that the case would be solved very soon. And he seemed to be very terrified at this statement. Right. It's almost like a, she hit a nerve. He's been somewhat cooperative with the police. Okay. So mm. he did lawyer up. I don't, I'm not going to fault anyone for getting an attorney. It's the responsible thing to do. Right. But he very quickly put himself in a situation where he's not talking to police or detectives unless his attorney is there. He's got the, the lawyer wall between law enforcement and himself. He has refused to take a lie detector test, which again, yeah, I'm not going to fault anybody for that. I don't know that I would ever agree to take one. Well, and what, what we look, what we've said about lie detector tests is there's normally three results that you passed or you're deceptive or it's inconclusive. So two of the three results are negative. Well, and if you're innocent, there's really no upside to <laughs> to the test at all for you. So this is the weird thing, though. He and Jason both pled the fifth at a grand jury inquiry into the murder. So they both refused to answer questions on the grounds that they might incriminate themselves. Right. They said. That's shady as. They said this had to do with they knew a small-time drug dealer and that they were, that the questions would have led to information about that situation. Right. And they didn't want to incriminate themselves in breaking the law in that manner, that it didn't have anything to do with the murder. But again, one thing that I always tell people And that I always point to, especially in this type of case where, look, the mayor says we got three suspects that we're looking at. Tommy, he looks better than the other two, in my opinion. The creepy rapist guy, yeah, we know him to be violent and he's he's a despicable human being, but we don't even know if there was any contact between the two of them, if they did, they even know each other at all. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, I guess he could have tried to pick her up that night, but still again with Tommy, we, we know 
they, they knew each other well. Yeah. We know that the spouse is usually uh, a good suspect. And two, he's he's already he has two shoes known to have been with the victim that a night, short period yeah. of time before her murder. Yeah, and then the alteration of the stories. I mean, not that he is changing it, but it's kind of strange that you didn't walk her home that night. You normally walk her home. It wasn't even like it was that much further along. And then they find her body, like you said, 400 feet from from where he claims they parted. Mm -hmm. And then this weird hangout. And look, look, look. I know... <laughs> uh, the nineties was not a hundred years ago. Not that odd for a 19 year old to be going to hang out with his buddy. I also question what is his buddy doing? Uh, how old was his buddy? Was his buddy living with parents? Do those parents work regular shifts? It's pretty late to be. Look, if I, if I had a 19 year old kid and his buddy stopped by on a school night, a night that I had to work, after midnight and they ordered food to me, that's a little late, too late. Maybe I'm an old curmudgeon, but I'm just saying, I think that's a little too late. It's fourth meal. Now, two months after Deanna was killed, Tommy's own mother was granted a restraining order against her son. This is per the Boston globe. Tommy's mom sought protection in court from her son, Tommy aged 19 at that time who was one of about 100 people who were questioned by police investigating Deanna's murder. A family friend told the reporter that the restraining order was not related to Deanna's case. She would say only that Tommy had threatened his mom, who he was living with at the time. Now, hold on. It's, it's related in the sense that it shows his character. This guy is going to be abusive towards women, his own mother. So it's not that far of a cry to think that this guy would be abusive towards his own girlfriend. Yes. Yeah, so this is, again, per the article, quote, things had been going on in the house that did not make her very comfortable, meaning the mother. He, meaning Tommy, has a pretty bad temper, but he never hurt her. The problems had been exacerbated by his mood swings following his girlfriend's killing. According to the article, his mother, who had some health issues, was eager for Tommy to get the help she believed that he needed. So Tommy moved out of the house, and this is when he moves in with his friend Jason before going on to live at another place uh, with his uncle, which is in another part of the state of Massachusetts. Now, based on all of these behaviors and actions, plus additional information that she was told by authorities and confidence, Catherine Kremen has stated overtly that although she initially didn't want to believe it, she now thinks that Tommy was responsible for what happened to Deanna. She believes that the authorities came to this same conclusion, but they've not been able to get enough evidence to put forth charges or they've just not. It wouldn't be that hard to get his DNA. Not done a great job on the investigation. I mean, she could even hire a, a PI to get a sample of his DNA. The problem is he's the boyfriend, though, because if if it's sexual assault, that's why I pointed out that I don't know how they arrived at that determination. Right. It would be important to the case to know more about that aspect of the crime as well as the crime scene itself, if she was believed to have been killed in that location or at that location. Because yeah. with the sexual assault, if you find someone else's DNA in regards to the sexual assault, mm -hmm. that gives you a suspect, a murder suspect. If you find Tommy's DNA, well, we know that they were boyfriend, girlfriend. They had a long-term relationship. She was at his house that night. It can be explained away. Yeah, but he, he doesn't have to be the killer to be, you know, he doesn't have to be a rapist and a killer in her mm. situ in this situation. He could simply be the boyfriend and the killer. Again, if I'm, if I'm the mother, I'm the father. I, if I'm a fa family friend or, or just a friend, I'm hiring a private investigator. I'm getting his DNA. I'm having it tested. 
or get in at least to police to say, look, here's his DNA. Because what police have is the records of actually talking to Tommy. And maybe Tommy said, hey, we, uh, yeah, we made out and stuff, but no, no, we didn't have sex that night. We don't know what he has answered uh, in the interviews with police. Now, unfortunately, after Deanna's murder, Catherine's marriage to Michael Kremen fell apart. You know, we've seen this time and time again in these cases where bereaved parents are dealing with their grief in different ways. Catherine descended into alcoholism. She lost her job at the accounting department. She lost her house and she temporarily lost custody of two of her three other kids. Uh, Two of them were minors at this time. It took years for her to pull herself back together. Deanna's sister, Christine, had to step in and act as a parental figure as a parental figure to her two little brothers for some time. She said to Boston dot com, quote, my mother and father both fell apart. I had to be the mother to my two brothers at 18 years old. I want to applaud her effort and her love towards her family. She said that it, it, she said that it wasn't Deanna dying. It was like my whole family pretty much died. Devastated by the loss of Deanna and the disintegration of the family, Michael Kremen died in 2008 at the age of just 58. Wow. And it stated, quote, he truly died a broken man over the loss of Deanna. It destroyed him. And tragically, Deanna's sister, Christine, died at the age of 40 in 2017 without ever seeing her sister's case solved. Yeah, again, this is a tough one. I mean, you would think that, again, with the three suspects, it's hard to know where the the local creep is. But look, if this guy is a rapist and an attempted murderer, it's probably just going to get worse and worse for him as far as the crimes. And he might possibly be back in jail right now for all we know. This, is it worse for parents of a murdered child to feel that nothing is happening in the investigation, that no one is really working on the case? Or is it worse if parents are continually told that there is hope, that there is movement on the case, only to have their hopes dashed over and over again? Because the latter is what has happened for Catherine Kremen. Authorities keep dangling a resolution and then it fails to materialize yeah and and we've seen that like within the delphi murders it seems like they keep saying hey we're we're one piece away well you've been saying that for years so Mm -hmm. maybe maybe you're more than one piece away uh you know i I don't know it's it's very difficult because it's same way with like missing person cases i used to fault the family for not wanting to get heavily involved but then you've seen families that get heavily involved in a case and then they get railroaded so the more we do this the more on a case-by-case basis the family the individual has to decide what's correct for them and it's just it's such a tragic thing to see and again i love how they describe her they don't describe her as perfect but she was perfect to them with all her flaws she was perfect to them and to see how much this can crush a family and alter so many people's lives. It's, it's, it's sad and it's pathetic and it's, and it's also pathetic that we live in a society where just because you're female, that puts a motive on your back for murder or rape or whatever. I mean, it's pathetic. I guess, I guess having hope is not a bad thing. If, if you're going to dive into the case, doing as much research as you can uh, and collecting your own evidence, listening to the cops, I think is important, but doing your own research and your own investigation would be important as well. Well, I want to go through some of the timeline of things that have taken place since the murder. So on the 10th anniversary, if you will, of Deanna's murder, the Boston Globe article 
a Boston Globe article ran that said authorities said yesterday they are closer than they have ever been to finding the person who killed Deanna. The Middlesex District Attorney's Office said that the new forensic technology has helped authorities make progress in the case and that investigators are looking for specific people who they believe know what happened. In the last couple of months, we believe we've made some developments on the forensic front. This was said by the district attorney. However, the district attorney declined to provide specific details, right. but did say we do believe that a person or people know about this murder and may have seen this murder, and we urge them to come forward. This article goes on to quote Catherine and says, I believe I know who is the person responsible, but I am not allowed to talk about it. I don't want to hurt the investigation. So that was in 2005, but nothing happened. No charges, no arrest. All that happened was that six different district attorneys have since been in office over the years. And every time that a new one comes in, the investigation gets a bump, gets hyped up a little bit, right. and then nothing ever really happens. In 2009, the new district attorney stated that the murder would be solved, but law enforcement needed witnesses who had remained silent to come forward. Again, nothing. Did the new district attorney come forward and say it's going to take another six district attorneys to get this thing solved? Well, six more years passed, and in 2015, another article ran in the Boston Herald this time saying that the case is still an open and very active investigation. The district attorney at that time added that within the past six months, let's just say there's been some advances in the case, but would not comment further. Around that same time, Boston.com contained the following information. Evidence is being reanalyzed using forensic technology that didn't exist 20 years ago. This according to the district attorney. This continues to be a very active investigation, but the family has heard this obviously before. And it's just frustrating that they keep being told that this is going to be solved and that they're going to get some action here and some results. And it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Well, the thing is, and, and, and we know this, as as time goes on, that technology gets better. And th- this is definitely a field of technology. We, we need smart individuals that are passionate about solving crimes to get involved in the sciences behind these. And we're going to start seeing hundreds of cold cases solved because of new technology. And it's just pathetic that there is, there is some scumbag piece of shit out there that's been out there living a free life while this family suffers. Well, and I think the situation that they're really looking for here, look, that's what they have to say kind of publicly. Hey, we're, we're making some movement on this case. It's really heating up. We're going to solve this thing soon. But notice every time they say that they are asking for witnesses to come forward. Right. Well, that's, it's almost an excuse to get it back in the papers or on the news to say that there's we've made some movement right. on this case. Is it really just you're just throwing that out there because you're reminding the public that this murder happened, that this young girl who had a big, bright future ahead of her was killed in a very violent way and personal way, in my opinion. And we need witnesses to come forward. We need people to tell us that. Person A was not where they say they were that night. Person A did not do what they said they did that night. Yeah, and it could be as simple as uh, the boyfriend's friend coming forward and saying, hey, story didn't go down the way he said it did. There was some information that came out in 2017, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to go through the full story because at first I thought this was really something... Here in this case, it made some sense when I first started looking at it. There was information that came out that said that it was a cover up at the time that the the whole thing was covered up by the mayor's office in 1995, that they were investigating someone that was somehow connected to powerful people 
mm-hmm. and that the mayor's office may have covered it up somehow. The reason why I don't want to stay on this very long is because Deanna's family does not believe that that is in any way true at all. And I think that the thing that we can cite here is the Somerville mayor at the time publicly stated that the police department was looking at three suspects. And Deanna's mother says that the mayor at the time, back in 95, has been one of the most supportive people in this entire case, supportive throughout the the years, right? Uh, over and over again. So, right, but to cover something up, you need to be extra supportive. If if she doesn't believe it, if the family doesn't believe it, I don't believe it. I don't know that this is any credible information at all. Again, the the, the problem with any type of cover up is a lot of these people get into positions where they're trying to serve the community. They get in those positions because they're good people that want to make a difference. So for those people to just turn a blind eye to this 17 year old child being murdered, you have to be a a low down pile of scum to, to do that. I'm not saying that cover ups don't happen. I'm just saying that it's normally where this whole institution is turning a blind eye or this whole organization or uh, you know, sometimes people go, oh, well, it's a cover up by the police department. So you're telling me 20 good people are turning a blind eye to a murder. Uh, it normally just doesn't line up or add up. It seems like Deanna's family believes that it's generally known who killed Deanna, but that the case is stalled because of a lack of evidence, or at least that's what they've been told by the district attorney. Now, whether or not a prosecution could be successful based on what they have or what we've seen that's been released to the public is really just a matter of opinion. You know, we've seen circumstantial evidence against Tommy, the boyfriend, the fact that he didn't walk her home, the fact that he hasn't cooperated, the fact that he was the last person to see her. They had two but then you have to wonder what is the actual physical evidence. Again, we want to know more about the crime scene, more about the evidence. Authorities are not saying what they have or what they do not have. And it has been stated, however, that Deanna was sexually assaulted. But again, it's not known how they came to that conclusion. So one thing that investigators are not talking about in this case is DNA. You know, it seems to me that had they found DNA on Deanna that did not belong to Tommy, the boyfriend or a family member, if there was stranger DNA on her, then that would have been revealed at some point over the years. Well, and like you said, I mean, you go, well, Tommy's her boyfriend. So of course his DNA is going to be on her touch. DNA is going to be on her. But if there's nobody else's DNA on her, then bingo. Well, and the thing too, Captain, why would this not be revealed? Because one, it would help the public. It might help these witnesses that you keep asking for come forward. And if there was stranger DNA, in theory, that would virtually clear Tommy from any suspicion at all. When we start questioning why the cops did this and why didn't they do this or why aren't, why aren't they coming out with more information? That's why you say, well, the, no shit. The case hasn't been solved. Yeah. And, and I, I really think that we're going to start learning more from this as, as time goes on. And in cases that are not solved from the eighties, cases that are not solved from the nineties, that law enforcement now is going to say, Hey, w- we need eyewitnesses to come forward in this murder case that happened over the weekend, we have to come out now with information because we can't wait 10 years. We can't wait 20 years when people move out of the area, people stop talking about it. You, again, you said, oh, well, the 90s, man, it's it's not that long ago. It feels to me like a million years ago. So if you have an individual that kind of has some suspicion or maybe did see Tommy walking a little bit further with his girlfriend that night than he claims he did. Well, so much time has gone past. You're not going to sit around and feel guilty or bad about it. You've probably moved on 
or you probably convinced yourself that maybe you didn't see it that way. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So as time goes on, you're less likely to get a witness that is sitting around all worried about it or somebody that maybe at first was scared that if it was Tommy two shoes, that he's going to come after them. Well, now after 20 years, maybe no contact with Tommy two shoes and they're going, Hey, I don't feel any threat. I don't feel any reason for coming forward. It's none of my business. Well, I will, I will try to put this in a, in a brighter light with a little bit of optimism here, because in 2019, the district attorney announced the launch of a new cold case unit. So of course they're going to be looking at murders and cold cases in that area. So I think that that is a positive move, especially in a case that I think is a little cold after all of these years. Now, Catherine, her mother, has been a fierce advocate for her daughter, for her daughter's case. Not only has she spoken publicly about the case on TV and in podcasts and in articles, but she's also the administrator of the Justice for Deanna Kremen Facebook page and has written a blog post about the case. She has organized marches, demonstrations, where she yells for justice through a megaphone. And she has made it clear over and over again to Tommy that she suspects him of killing her daughter. She has told Tommy time and time again that she will continue to be a pain in the ass until the case is solved. And her only real hope in light of the failure of the authorities to prosecute the case is that he may crack at some point and confess what he has done. Despite all the challenges facing the Kremen family, they have done a remarkable job of managing to keep Deanna's spirit alive for now over 25 years. In 1997, they got a billboard erected in Somerville that advertised a reward for information in the case. The billboard is renewed annually. On it appears the amount of the reward, which is currently $70,000, $70,000. And the words on the billboard say, quote, you know what you did to me. How much longer must I wait? Please help make my time in heaven restful. There are trees and benches around the city that are dedicated to Deanna. The Deanna Kremen Reward Scholarship gives $500 annually to a recipient in the child development program at SHS where Deanna was enrolled. In 2013, hundreds of people gathered to observe the 18th anniversary of Deanna's murder by symbolically walking her home, marching from the intersection where Tommy says he left her to the family's home. Catherine now has three grandchildren. Her granddaughter's middle name is Deanna. Anyone with information regarding Deanna Crimmins' death can contact the Middlesex County District Attorney's Office at 617-679-6600 or the Somerville Police Department at 617-625-6600. If you need more True Crime Garage in your ear balls, check out our bonus show called Off the Record. It's only on Stitcher Premium. Also, all of our old episodes are available everywhere. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher app, and now on Sirius XM app. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading? I own a couple of books from this father-daughter writing duo. This is the new book from David Myers and Elise Myers Walker, and it's titled A Murder in Amish, Ohio, The Martyrdom of Paul Koblenz. It's kind of weird because last week we recommended Harold Schechter's new book, Maniac, and I said he is one of the greatest true crime historians. Well, David Myers and Elise are some of the very best crime historians when it comes to the great state of Ohio, as these two unravel some of Ohio's most intriguing murder cases. Check out their latest, A Murder in Amish, Ohio. You can find that great title and many more 
on our recommended page at truecrimegarage.com. want to thank everybody for listening and joining us here in the garage. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.